you could turn with me, please, once again to the book of Galatians and chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 15 to the end of the chapter. We've looked at verse 15, but just for connection, uh, because it does flow into verse 16. And so beginning in verse 15, down to verse 24, Galatians chapter 1, it says this, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word. We were considering uh, last time how uh, the Lord had uh, set Paul apart from his mother's womb. Uh, and uh, called him by his grace. That was the Damascus Road experience. And it tells us the purpose of it all was to reveal his son in me. And then, of course, that I might preach him among the heathen. So we want to just kind of consider these things. Interesting that Paul, before he was a Christian, when he was Saul of Tarsus, the emphasis was on what he had done uh, as we considered a part of his story, uh, as we looked at it last time, we noticed that he talked about I, what he did. I persecuted the church of God. I advanced or was more exceedingly zealous. And so it was all about him, what he had done. You know, he was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was the most zealous uh, amongst his contemporaries. It's all about him. Now that he's a converted man, we notice a very different note in his message. It's no longer all about him, but it's all about what the Lord has done. And so the emphasis has certainly changed. Uh, the emphasis is on God's dealings with him, God who separated me, God who called me, God who revealed his son in me. And so there's an amazing shift. When it pleased God, verse 15, who separated me from my mother's womb, called me uh, by his grace to reveal his son in me. And I do think that that's one of the marks of conversion, isn't it? That, that suddenly there's a shift. It's uh, prior to salvation, people are always trying to do things themselves. They're trying to work, they're trying to be good, they're trying to. But then when somebody's truly converted, the, the shift is massive. It's now what God has done for me in Christ. <laughs> that's a big difference. And we see that in the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, what we notice too is in verse 12, uh, what began really as a revelation of Christ to Paul. So verse 12, 12, it says, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so when he first was saved, it was a revelation of Jesus Christ to him. But now we, we see a, a subtle shift. He says to reveal his son in me. <laughs> and so I want us to just focus on that subtle change. Um now, no longer so much that Christ revealed himself to Paul, but now uh, he's, uh, P Paul's life, in a sense, is a means of revealing Christ in him, the hope of glory. People are seeing something in him, this changed life. And so a revelation of Christ in Paul as the Spirit produces his fruit in unaccustomed soil. I like that. The Spirit produces his fruit in unaccustomed soil, and that fruit of the Spirit is Christ-likeness. And that's what God wants to do in all of us. He wants to reveal his Son in us. 
And so, uh, like John the Baptizer of, of old, I must decrease, he must increase. People want, want people to see more of Christ in us, uh, the hope of glory. And so now, to reveal his son in me. And of course, uh, seeing Christ in this man's life, seeing the change, seeing the, the transformation, Christ in him. That's the, the focus here. Um, so it's not Christ who was unveiled to him, by the way, but but Jesus uh, on that Damascus road. It's kind of interesting uh, that uh, when he said, who are you, Lord? Uh, the, the response was, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Uh, so it wasn't just kind of the Messiah, but it was Jesus, Jehovah, the Savior, Jehovah saves. And so uh, just an amazing thing that that's what was revealed to the Apostle Paul uh, was I am Jesus. And again, he talks here about revealing his son in me. Uh, that's an amazing statement for a Jew to acknowledge that the Lord Jesus is the son, is the son of God. And uh, I want to just go back to the book of Proverbs just for a moment. An, an amazing verse that uh, when we think of the Trinity, uh, the triunity of God in the Old Testament, because the Jews are monotheistic to the nth degree. And yet there are many scriptures in the Old Testament that would indicate the triunity of God. And in Proverbs and chapter uh, 30 and verse 4, it says this, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? And then the uh, ego, the son of Jacob, asks a question. <laughs> and he says, uh, here's the question. What is his name? It was this one that, that basically is the creator, the sustainer of all things. What is his name? And then he says this. What is his son's name, if thou canst tell us? <laughs> well, isn't it wonderful? We can say, I know who what his son's name is. I know what his name is. I know what his son's name is. His son's name is Jesus, the, the son of God. And so we, we see Paul here recognizing the fact that Jesus, the one who appeared to him on that Damascus road, was one who was absolute deity. And so he says to reveal his son in me. And so he's the son of God. He's equal with God. Uh, thus, uh, these great truths concerning the deity of the Lord Jesus was revealed to him on the Damascus Road. Who art thou, Lord? Quite a statement. He recognized a divine person appearing to him. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And of course, the Lord Jesus had been crucified because he claimed that he was the son of God, making himself equal with God. And so all this became very, very clear to the Apostle Paul. This revelation of the, the, the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus not only saved him, it also transformed him. And I want to suggest to you that the fullness of that revelation is what absolutely just thrilled the heart of the Apostle Paul. And, of course, he began to preach that uh, amongst the Gentiles, uh, This who this person was. And so, uh, interesting, isn't it, how God has a tremendous sense of humor in many ways. He selected a man before he was born for the job of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, I don't know who you would have picked, but he picked a Pharisee of the Pharisees, one who was advanced in Judaism way beyond his brethren. Now, if we were going to do it, we'd say, oh, this guy, uh, he's set apart to reach the Jews with the gospel. I mean, he's our perfect man to reach the Jews. He knows Judaism like the back of his hand. I mean, he he's, he's kind of raised by Gamaliel. I mean, he's the perfect evangelist to the Jews. And yet God says, no, no, actually I've set you apart from your mother's womb to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. I suspect that he grew up at the very least looking down on Gentiles. Many Jews called them dogs, right? And it wasn't, as we've often said, it wasn't uh, uh, pedigree dogs here, mongrels, mutts, they, they viewed them that way. In fact, some Jews, not all, but but many of them uh, believed 
that the reason God created Gentiles was to fuel the fires of hell. And so here's a man that would have grown up with, at, at the very least, a strong bias against the Gentiles, most likely a hatred towards them. And God says, okay, now I'm going to send you to the very people who you once despised. And, and that's just so remarkable to think of, isn't it? And so he's, he, he says, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, amongst the Gentiles, amongst the nations. And then notice what he's going to preach, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Again, we, so often we can kind of get the gospel into some kind of formula. And what we find is the apostles preached a person, not a formula. They preached him. They preached the one who is the eternal son of God, who ever lived in the bosom of the father, that, that was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, that went to Calvary and died for us. Their message was a person. It was the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to preach him and oh, how we need to preach him. Uh, that's uh, that's got to be the core of our message. It's him. It's all about him. We can. We, it's amazing. We can skirt around and preach all kinds of things about about Christianity and miss Christ in the process. No, preach him. He says he called me to preach him, not the plan of salvation, but the person of the Savior, of whom salvation is found. Jehovah saves. He is the Savior. He's the only Savior. So Paul has now made it clear that not only in his conversion but also his call to serve among the Gentiles. It was a work fully, entirely of God, separate from any other influence, right? So God revealed himself to him on the road to Damascus. God also revealed his purposes to him as well. And it was clearly all and entirely of God. No other person connected. Now, our title this morning is connected with his preparation for ministry. And I want to just kind of focus our attention on how God prepared this man for the work of which he had called him, preparation for ministry. And so we're introduced to Paul's post-conversion movements. Uh, what happened after he got saved? What were some of his early movements? What was God doing at this time? How was the Lord teaching him? And so we can we can divide it up pretty clearly. We begin with what happened immediately, because he tells us, verse, verse 16, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And so we've got uh we've got we got a what happened immediately. And then uh later on, uh, we're gonna see what happened after three years, verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. Okay, so we got, we're all got these kind of time markers. What happened immediately? Uh, what happened after three years? And then uh, the final section, verse 21, uh, down to verse 24, what happened afterwards? Afterwards, I came to the region of Syria and Cilicia. Okay, so we're going to divide it up with these three kind of markers. Immediately, after three years, and then afterwards, after that <laughs> time as well. And so that's how we're going to divide up his movements uh, just from the text itself. So what happened immediately? Well, first of all, he tells us he conferred not with flesh and blood. Now, again, he's not disparaging his fellow apostles, but he's just demonstrating that his ministry was not received from them. He had no connection with them for the first three years. Uh, okay, so so again, he, there's there's no connection whatsoever with the twelve in terms of receiving uh, anything from them. This was all from God. His just pur purposes that his conversion and calling were all directly from God, not from uh, other people, not secondhand conferred upon him from others. And so he conferred not with flesh and blood. And he tells us in verse 17, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So he acknowledges that as to the time, they were apostles before him. But they, they certainly, they may have been before him in time, but they weren't, they had no priority over him. 
right? His apostleship was received from the same person. Actually, theirs was received from Christ on earth. His was received from Christ from heaven, uh, the, the risen glorified Christ. But certainly, uh, they may have been before him in time, but they were not in advance of him in any way. His apostleship uh, received directly from the risen glorified Christ. So the same person had commissioned both. Now, what we want to do now, we're just going to uh, kind of go to the book of Acts now, because we want to trace his early movements. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 9 and just learn some of the things that occurred after his conversion, tying it in with this portion here in chapter 1, verse 17 of Galatians. So if you could just turn with me to Acts chapter 9 for a moment. And I, I found this very fascinating studying this uh, myself, these early movements of the Apostle Paul. And we're going to consider Acts 9, 20 through 22, tying it in with what we've seen uh, so far in Galatians. And so uh, notice um, the details of his post-conversion experience. So verse 20, so this is after he's converted. He says, um, it, it was certain days with the disciples, which were in Damascus, verse 19. And then it says, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. So first thing he does, preaching Christ in the synagogues in Damascus, that he is the son of God. Now, no doubt his, his prior knowledge of the Old Testament, and remember as a Pharisee, there'd have been a lot of memorization of huge tracts of the Old Testament, but now he's illuminated by the Holy Spirit. He's suddenly got a new understanding, especially having seen Christ on that road to Damascus. And so clearly illuminated uh, by this new revelation he'd received. And and uh, because he's filled with the Holy Spirit, we saw that again in Acts um, 9 and verse uh, 17, uh, where it says, Ananias went his way, entered into the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So now here's a man full of the Holy Spirit. He's already full of Scripture. <laughs> He's come to see Christ as the key to the Scriptures, right? You, you search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. Now suddenly he's got the key that unlocks the whole door. Uh, and, and so all of a sudden now he's got a new understanding, marvelous understanding. And so he's beginning to preach. And what is his message? He's preaching in the synagogues that Christ is the Son of God. And so uh, amazing, amazing teaching. Now look at verse uh, 21. It says, and again, just thinking of this, that the, this is, by the way, the, the only occurrence of the phrase Son of God in the book of Acts. Preach Christ that he is the Son of God. And yet, um, the Apostle Paul used that term, Son of God, at least 15 times in his epistles. And so, again, this idea of recognizing the, the absolute deity of Christ, that he is the eternal Son who ever lived in the bosom of the Father, very key to his understanding. And so he preached Christ that he is the Son of God in the synagogue. And notice verse 21, uh, it says uh, that all that heard him were amazed and said, is not this he that destroyed them, that called on his name in Jerusalem, and came hither for the intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. The word amazed there, I mean, our English word amazed is, is probably insufficient in some ways. The Greek word is literally they were beside themselves. They, they were out of their senses. <laughs> it's almost like they almost lost their minds. The last thing they ever expected with with from this man who was their champion persecutor of the disciples of Christ. <laughs> and so they knew he was coming. They were probably excited and looking forward to his visit because he was coming to deal with these pesky disciples of Christ. And yet out of his very mouth, his, he preached unto them that, that uh, Jesus <laughs> preached Christ in the synagogue, that he is the son of God. And that was, they were just beside themselves. They were, they were just totally, we would say they were blown away. They were just, they were staggered 
to hear this. And you, wouldn't you love to have been a fly on the wall in the synagogue when he began to preach that? I mean, sometimes I'd like to think about, wouldn't it be amazing just to have been there as a kind of a, a sat in the back seat, not, not anybody knowing you there, but just seeing these events must have been incredible. Certainly it was the last thing that they expected to hear out of the mouth of their champion was a confession that Christ was the Son of God. And then verse 22, it says, But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Now, again, now it, it, increasing the more in strength, confounding the Jews. So, so in one sense, uh, in the previous verse, he's preaching Christ. Now he's proving without question that this is very Christ. And, and so this idea of confounding, uh, that there's a there's a kind of a more detail here, confounding, proving that this is very Christ. And so something has happened between plain preaching in verse 21 and this proving in verse 22. And so uh, there, there are many that believe that between verse 22 and verse 21 and verse uh, 22, uh, sorry, verse 20 and verse 22, is when Paul went into Arabia. So just keep your finger in Acts 9, but coming back there, but I want you to go back to Galatians 1.17. He says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were be apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. So he's initially in Damascus. He goes to Arabia. He comes back to Damascus. Now, again, it doesn't mention it here in Acts chapter 9, so we've got to figure out where we're going to put the Arabia thing. And many believe that the Arabia incident occurred between verse 20, where he's preaching Christ, and verse 22, where he is confounding and proving. And so there was something happened that uh, that changed his ministry, made it even more effectual uh, because uh, of perhaps his time in the Arabian desert. And so that's the position we're going to take, at least uh, from our perspective. We can't be dogmatic about it, but it seems that that's where you would want to fit that because he does return back to Damascus. So what happened in Arabia and why did he go to Arabia? Those are some interesting questions. There's a thought that God took him, just like he did Moses, into the backside of the desert to teach him. Sometimes God does that with a person, right? He takes them out, kind of away from other influences, getting along with God and learning from God. And so certainly Moses had his vision of God. Where did he first see uh, that bush that was burning? What was in the backside of the desert, right? That's where he first got to know that God was the, the great I am. And so now Paul finds himself in Arabia. And during that Arabian period, time of quietness, uh, by revelation, given a new understanding of the Old Testament scriptures that enabled him afterwards to use them as a, as a basis to both confirm and prove and confound that Jesus is the very Christ of God. So why Arabia? Um, of course, we do believe that he was going to, he revealed great many truths to the Apostle Paul, what we call the mystery doctrines of the New Testament, things that were revealed to him that were hidden in ages past, but revealed to Paul, the great truth of the one body, uh, the great truth of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the great mystery teachings. Uh, could that have been in his three years in the Arabian desert? Many, many things would have been clarified in his mind so that he could minister effectively when he returned to Damascus. Now, just another interesting thing, and again, keep your finger in Acts 9, we're going to come back there. But I want you to look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 25. Galatians 4, 25. Now, let me see. That's not the verse I'm looking for. Oh dear, we did this last time. Let's see, three. I'm thinking of um, 
the law being given in Arabia. Let me look further down. Yeah, verse 25. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Just an interesting little statement, isn't it? Mount Sinai in Arabia. I just want you to think about this for a minute. Going back to Acts chapter 9, bearing in mind Galatians 1.17, just as Moses received the law in Mount Sinai, which is where? In Arabia. Where does the Apostle Paul re receive the message of the grace of God? <laughs> in Arabia. <laughs> is that significant? I think it really is. And so, yeah, just as Moses got the law on Mount Sinai in Arabia, Paul received his clear message concerning the marvelous truth of the grace of God in the very same area. And it transformed his views completely. Uh, he now, in Galatians 4, will link Sinai and the law uh, to bondage and, and to Hagar, uh, whereas the message of grace is to Jerusalem, which is above, which is free. And so he gets a completely radical rethink of the whole law, which he had been zealous of. And where did he get it? In the very same place in Arabia, where the message of law had been conferred on Moses. So what did he do there? Saul, the Old Testament scholar par excellence, I believe enrolled in a three-year course taught by the Holy Spirit on how every symbol Every sacrifice, every picture in the Old Testament relates to the person and work of the Lord Jesus. If you go to seminary today, you graduate with a DD, a Doctor of Divinity. Well, Saul graduated much more powerfully with a Doctorate of the Desert. <laughs> and God taught him the message of grace in the backside of the desert. And so uh, what a wonderful thing that God instructed this man. And uh, so he was able, now enabled to confound, he says, again, back in chapter 9, it says, Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving this is very Christ. And uh, after the many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So effective was he that in their minds, the only way to deal with this man is put him out of commission. They wanted to kill him. And of course, uh, he was delivered out in a basket. Now, let's go back to Galatians chapter 1, having had that little divergence in the book of Acts. And we move on to the next section, and then after three years. And that's why we've been saying the three years. We His conversion, his trip to Arabia, uh, and then following that, the the return to Damascus. We're kind of that's a three year period that that this all this took place in. After this, it says, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. So he goes up to Jerusalem. Now it's it's interesting, he's not commanded to go up to Jerusalem to appear before the apostles. Uh it's some kind of examination. Uh, this is indicated by the words uh, in, in in verse 18 where he says, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. And what I'm told is that word to see speaks of someone coming as a tourist. It's a word used, uh, Chrysostom would tell us this, by those who go to see great and famous cities. So the idea is that, that Paul was not commanded to come to Jerusalem to give an account uh, to Peter or other disciples, but he came of his own accord and visited as a tourist. But while he was there, he, he sought the opportunity to meet with the apostles, uh, and particularly with the apostle Peter and Peter alone. And so he's going up there. He's not, he, again, he's not being called on the carpet. He's not being summoned uh, summarily to come up there. He's gone of his own accord. And of course, uh, you're going somewhere and you know that there are people that are connected with the same message you are. You want to go see them. Uh, it's just a natural thing. Uh, you want to investigate. You want to see if you can get to visit them while you're there. And that's exactly what he does. And so he says that uh, he, he 
went, went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and aboard with him 15 days. Again, another fly on the wall moment. Would love to have heard what they discussed uh, as they compared notes <laughs> concerning the Lord Jesus. It would have been quite an interesting exp experience. And, and so no commission or, or anything like that. But notice um, in verse 19, it says, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. So <clears throat> I want you to just notice this, that um, this is, I guess, two ways of looking at this verse. Oh, the other apostles saw I none, but the other person of prominence that I saw would have been James, the Lord's brother. That's one view. Other view is that, that there were other apostles other than the 12, others that were recognized as apostles, not in the same sense as the 12. And of course, we... Uh, we, we've discussed this a little bit in our question and answer session, but let's just look at this, uh, how sometimes that's referred to uh, other people other than the 12 referred to as apostles. So if you look at Acts 14 and verse 14, it says, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. And now we have Barnabas, who is considered to be an apostle. Uh, Romans chapter 16 and verse 7. Uh, Salute Androniacus and Junior, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who were of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. And so it, it, it could be that there were others who were recognized as apostles, uh, one sent with a commission. But in a secondary sense, they had not accompanied Christ uh, since the very beginning. Uh, they had not, uh, you know, they weren't kind of the part of the 12, but they certainly uh, would have been uh, considered to be the fourfold gifting apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. They would have been considered to have apostolic ministry in those days. Um, again, um, they didn't fulfill those complete communication uh, qualifications of Acts 1, 21 and 22, uh, because if James is one of them, and of course it does say uh, that he went up uh, to see uh, other ap the apostles saw a non save James, the Lord's brother. Well, James doesn't fit the qualification of Acts 1. Let's just go back to Acts 1 to, as they were selecting a replacement for Judas and the 12. Notice what the qualifications were in verse 21 and 22. Wherefore of these men, which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day he was taken up from us, must be ordained to be a witness with us of the resurrection. Well, certainly James, the Lord's brother in John 7 and verse 4, Five, it tells us, neither did his brethren believe on him. And then we have 1 Corinthians. Let's just look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7 to find out when James received Christ. And it tells us in verse uh, 7 of 1 Corinthians 15, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And so it would seem that James, the Lord's brother, author of our New Testament, book of James, was converted after the resurrection. Like the other brethren of the Lord, he didn't believe until he saw Christ risen from the dead, and then he believed him. And so, the, again, they're, they're of a secondary type of apostle and uh, not uh, the same apostles as the 12, or of Paul, who was unique as well, and we want to acknowledge their uniqueness, but they were, we would say, perhaps modern missionaries uh, in that sense. They were sent with a commission uh, and served God under that commission. Now notice verse 20. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Now again, very strong af affirmation here implies he has been attacked and that he's only regarded as a secondary apostle by the Galatians as a result of the influence of the Judaizers. And so that's why 
he has to uh, say, I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth here, that I had no connection with the, uh, my apostleship was independent of them. It took three years before I went and saw them. And so he's just affirming this because it would seem that the Judaizers were saying, Paul is inferior. He's he's not the same as the the original apostles. He's kind of some second rate apostle. And he's affirming that that's not the case. Now notice verse 21, it says, Afterwards, I came into the region of Syria and Cilicia. So after this 15-day visit to Jerusalem, spending time with Peter, seeing James, and now he goes into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Uh, again, no gaps in the narrative here. After his brief visit, he's escorted down to Caesarea, the Roman seaport on the coast of Palestine. And from there, he took ship to his native Tarsus, where he remained evangelizing his hometown and homeland until Barnabas comes to get him uh, in Acts chapter 11. And so he's basically just giving us all of his, his details, all of his trips. His next visit to Jerusalem will be mentioned in chapter 2 when he goes up again. But for now, that's his only visit to the apostles. Little is known of his activity, by the way, in the regions of Syria and Cilicia, other than his missionary efforts must have been quite successful. Because if you look at Acts chapter 15, when the letter is sent from the Jerusalem council uh, concerning the fact that uh, converted Gentiles do not have to be circumcised, do not have to be subject to the law, uh, we, we find that the letter is sent in Acts 15, verse 23. It says, And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren, send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch, and then notice, and Syria and Cilicia. Okay, Syria and Cilicia. Look at verse 41 of Acts 15 as well. It says, and he went through Syria and Cilicia confirming the churches. Okay. So I just want you to see that, that, that his time in Syria and Cilicia must have been effective because it produced churches. So Acts 15, when they're sending this letter uh, to affirm that, that those that are converted from the, the Gentiles don't have to become Jews, don't have to be circumcised, part of the destination are the churches in Syria and Cilicia. And so, no doubt, his evangelistic labors were very, very useful. Now, during this period, there is a strong thought, and again, we can't be dogmatic because we, we all we've got is the little pieces of evidence that we see in Scripture, and we're trying to put them together. But it would seem that during that time, he incurred the displeasure of his father and was disinherited. You say, well, where do you get that from? Look at Philippians with me, please. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Philippians 3, verse 8. We're going to tie this in with another verse from Acts. But Philippians 3, verse 8, it says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now, I want you to imagine him showing up in Cilicia, which is where Tarsus was, his hometown, and the shock when his father finds out that this son, who he's invested heavily in, in you know, uh, allowing Gamaliel to instruct him and teach him, a man who's a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and now he believes in the despised Messiah, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a strong thought that his father basically disinherited him. And that can often happen when people are saved out of more orthodox Jewish backgrounds. Sometimes what happens is they'll, take, they'll have a funeral and they'll say, this my son who is alive, he's dead. It's like they'll just completely disinherit them. So, so where do we get that? Now, I want you to go look at another scripture now in Acts 11. When Barnabas goes to find Saul to bring him to Antioch, I want you to notice verse Acts 11, verse 20, uh, 
For, speaking of Barnabas, he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, much people were added to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. That word that's used there, to seek Saul, is used elsewhere in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 45. Remember when the Lord Jesus had been left behind in Jerusalem and his parents were three days on the caravan going back to Nazareth and they realized he's not here. And it says this, there was a basically a frantic search. Where is he? That's the very same word that's used here. And so Barnabas is going to Tarsus. Now, he didn't just say, okay, uh, where's, um, where's Saul of Tarsus from? Let's go knock on the door. And you can imagine him knocking on the door, the father coming, uh, where's Saul? He said, who's Saul? I don't know anybody called Saul. <laughs> He's disinherited him, you see. And so he has to make a frantic search. And then it says, verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Obviously not easy to find him in Tarsus, even though that's the place he was raised. That's the place he grew up in. And so it would seem that during that time, there was this disinheritance from his father. And by the way, there are many that have been disinherited for the cause of Christ, especially from religious people. There are many that have paid a huge price to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. But think about it. Yeah, it, it's a, it is a price. It, it, there's rejection by loved ones, by peers, by all of those people. But it's better to lose all our peers than to lose our own souls <laughs> to be accepted with our family. And so here's this man, gloriously saved, now set apart to serve the Lord amongst the Gentiles, but great rejection. I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but dung that I may win Christ. And so notice verse 22, it says, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Unknown. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? Obviously, they hadn't learned about celebrity converts at this point. You know what happens if some some NFL star or some famous person uh, professes salvation? Immediately, they're on the circuit, and they're, they're being paraded from place after place after place to give their testimony. And yet, Paul's status in the churches of Judea was unknown. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? And again, and was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. And so obviously the apostles, when he came and told his story, they didn't say, oh, boy, let's book you for testimonies. We're going to have you give your testimony in every meeting in Judea. Everybody's got to hear this message. You know, you're a celebrity now, celebrity convert. And so none of that stuff at all. In fact, he's unknown and and yet um, spending time serving the Lord in obscurity. And, and sometimes uh, it, it's just good, isn't it, to be happy, to be unknown. Uh, think of Jane Darby, you look at his grave and it, it just simply says, unknown and yet well-known. <laughs> I, I like that, unknown and yet well-known. Known to God but unknown in many ways. And so he was unknown by faith to the churches in Judea, which were in Christ, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. And so what they did hear was they knew about something radical had happened. This champion of Judaism, this persecutor, is now preaching the faith which once he destroyed. And so certainly he, he's clearly an, a wonderful object of divine grace. And it is amazing, isn't it? The more certainly grace works in us, the more attached shall we be to the gospel of grace and more opposed we will be to all those errors which seek to rob God of his glory. This man loved the grace of God <laughs> because of his story, right? I mean, he just, what a transition, what a transformation. 
And so because of that, uh, he he preaches the faith which once he destroyed, and he just loves the, the, the concept of the grace of God. He, undeserved. I didn't deserve this. Uh, I, I guess if uh, he, he could have almost written John Newton's great hymn, Amazing Grace, how, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Uh, but he loves the grace of God. And, and again, I think the more we realize what God has saved us out of, the more we want to magnify his grace and defend the grace of God against any that would seek to attack it. And notice verse 24, and they glorify God in me. Glorified God in me. I wonder if we had this mindset, I, I do desire to live the Christian life so that people may glorify God in me, that they might they might see the mighty grace that has wrought such a change in us, and and see the the zeal, the fervency, uh, and marvel at that amazing grace of God that has brought us to be consecrated to Christ. They glorified God in me. They could see a work that God had done, and so this whole section, Paul is really showing us. There was enough contact between him and the other apostles to show that they were in perfect agreement, but not so much that it showed that Paul got his gospel from them instead of God. And so that's why we have this visit. Paul's whole point in the second part of the chapter that we're gonna that we just looked at is the gospel was true, his experience was valid because it really came directly from God. It wasn't something passed on secondhand. It was really directly from God. Now we we want to uh, just briefly introduce chapter two. And we'll, we'll just mention we're still in the historical section of the book, which is comprises chapters one and two. Um, in the previous chapter, we've just seen Paul the apostle has established clearly that both his apostolic authority and the gospel he preached were divinely given. In this chapter now, he's going to demonstrate that his apostolic authority and his gospel was recognized by his fellow apostles. They, they're going to give him the right hand of fellowship. They're going to say, we're with you. We agree with you concerning your calling, concerning your message, uh, that, that he's going to he's going to have that affirmed very clearly. So the chapter divides nicely, chapter two, into two sections. In verses one through ten, we're going to see Paul conferring with the apostles in Jerusalem, and so it says, fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, took Titus with me, and of course he's going up. He's going to meet the rest of the apostles, and so he's conferring with the apostles at Jerusalem in verses 1 through 10. In verse 11 through 21, he's confronting Peter in Antioch. He's going to have an eyeball to eyeball with Peter, and he's going to rebuke Peter publicly uh, because of compromise on the part of Peter. And so we're going to see these two uh, important things. Paul's conferring with the apostles in Jerusalem, Peter confronting Paul confronting Peter in Antioch. And so two visits, Paul going up to Jerusalem, Peter going down to Antioch, and all of the various things connected with it. Paul's visit was private. Peter's visit was public. In Paul's visit, the matter dealt with preaching and the content of the gospel. In Peter's visit, the matter dealt with his practice practice which sadly was not in conformity to the preaching. Peter had preached one thing, but he was doing another thing altogether. And that's why Paul's going to confront him, because his practice and his preaching were not in harmony. That's a challenge to all of us, isn't it? Practice and preaching should be the same. Peter's wasn't, and there was inconsistency, and that's why he's confronted by Paul. And so we've got to take care that we preach and practice, and the two are in perfect harmony with each other. So Paul going up to Jerusalem. When Paul went up to Jerusalem, and who went with him? 
And so he says, 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now, there are two visits in the book of Acts that describe Paul and Barnabas going up to Jerusalem together. One of them is concerning famine relief in Acts chapter 11. And the other one is to do with the, the, the council in Jerusalem about Gentiles getting saved in Acts 15. And so we've got to determine this 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem, is it chapter 11 visit or is it chapter 15 visit? Okay, that's a big question and one in which many commentators are disagreed. The incident recorded here in Galatians would seem, as far as I can understand, to be the first of these visits, the famine visit. Paul dates the event as being 14 years after. Now, it's not certain whether it means 14 years after his conversion or 14 years after his first visit. We're not sure about that. But what we, we do think interesting, although scholars are divided over whether it's the famine visit or the Jerusalem council visit, it seems to me that if it was the Jerusalem council visit, why did Paul not just produce the letter that had been written by the apostles saying that we should not put the, the, the law, the, the bondage on the Gentiles? I mean, that would just shut the whole thing down. Just produce the letter. That's, I mean, that gives you all the apostolic authority and everything. Secondly, why did he not mention the famine visit? You see, he's, he's telling us he went up and now he's saying, 14 years afterwards, he goes up again. But if there had been this Acts 11 visit in between, why does he not mention it? So it seems to me clearly that it's the Acts 11 visit that is in view because he does not in any way re allude to the decrees of the Jerusalem Council in this letter in combating the same problem. And surely he would have done that had he had them. And so it would seem to me that it's Acts chapter 11. One last thought, and that is, why did he take Barnabas and Titus with him? And of course, the answer is this, and this is why he's mentioning here to connect him with the Galatians, is that everything has to be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 16, and we'll finish with this scripture reference, but it's very important that God, uh, under the Old Testament economy and here, even in connection with discipline in the church, he says, but if he will not hear thee, this is Matthew 18, verse 16, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And so the reason that he takes these two men with him is that the, the message that he's going to convey here, that, that is that, that his gospel was accepted by the apostles, is now supported by other witnesses that were there, two or three. So may God encourage us with this uh, thought today. God preparing a man to preach Christ among the Gentiles. What is God preparing you to do? <laughs> because he... If he's preparing us, he has something that he's prepared us for. What is that? May the Lord continue to prepare us and make us ready for that which he's preparing us for. Amen.